Hello and welcome to another episode of Line Trippies CX Book Club. We are absolutely delighted to be joined for this very special edition to the amazing Brian Horn. Brian, welcome to our book club. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. Thank you so much, Chris. Good to see you welcome. again. We, uh, uh, we don't have many um, kind of serial authors, but obviously uh, you're, you're, you're just kind of getting out, getting to your stride now. I can see a whole series of books coming on, on your theme. So delighted we can catch you before you get stratospheric in terms of your fame and uh, it's impossible to uh, get any time with you. So uh, thank you for joining us. Right. <laughs> so the, <laughs> no way, the way this works, the way this works is um, uh, I'll uh, get all of our wonderful CX uh, guests to introduce themselves. And um, then they've all taken the time to, uh, to read your, your book, um, which uh, hopefully uh, arrived. Has everyone got a copy of their book? Are you able to give us a flash? There we go. Make sure we've all got the same book. Yeah. Thank goodness for that. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Um, and, uh, and what we'll do is we've got questions to pose. So we'll start with a question each. And then um, if time allows, we'll get on to more questions. We've got more guests joining us. Um, so that, that's kind of how it will work. So as he was the first one who popped into my um, review room, I'll come to you first, um, Tom Kerr. Would you mind giving us a, a quick introduction to who you are, and then we'll go around the table and then come back to what you got from the book. Okay, Christopher, thank you very much. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tom Kerr. I'm a market researcher, and I've spent half my life on the client side, and I cut my teeth on the agency side in London, working for two of the big agencies, now known as Kantar and GFK. And now I'm at that stage in life where I'm getting ready for retirement, but it's a delight to be here today to take part in the book club. Thank you, Tom. Um, Olga, can I come to you next? Yep. Hello, my name is Olga. I am based in St. Petersburg, Russia, working globally. I run my own consulting company called Integrity Consult. And before that, I had um, experience working in CX and marketing in some large organizations like uh, British Airways. Wonderful. Thank you, Olga. And uh, Nick, another um, researcher, could I come to you? Yeah, yeah. Well, research background. So, um, yeah, started in e-commerce and then found myself in customer experience research, um, led the function uh, for Ipsos Mori in the UK, um, and then moved across, did some work at Kantar on shopper behaviour, um, and now set up a business called Paradigm CX, which focuses on helping businesses with CX strategy and measurement. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you so much, Nick. Thank you very much. And I know you're all kind of vocal voices in the community of CX, which is wonderful. We have three more joining us at some point. Um, Rodrigo works alongside me, so he's, um, he's here for the beer. Um, and uh, I'll come to you then, Brian. So we, we um, spoke earlier this year um, mm -hmm. covering a broad topic of customer service, and just how really organisations needed to pull their socks up, we might say, and uh, start having a greater respect for the customer. Uh, we had a really good conversation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and uh, it was an opportunity to kind of just delve a little bit into your book. But on the back of that, um, we felt compelled to invite you to our book review. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward to kind of asking some, some hopefully not too challenging questions, but some, some questions which will help the, uh, the, those viewing to really get a better appreciation of your book. But of course, you're not just an author. You're more broader than that. So would you mind taking a couple of steps back and just giving us an appreciation of who you are and, and how you fit into the world of customer yeah. centricity? I'd love to, Chris. Well, you know, CX is my passion. It's what I live and breathe. It's literally in my DNA um, because part of it's the way I was raised um, with the values that I was raised with about business and people. Um, Professionally, though, I've been a manager all my life, um, primarily in the financial industry. I've managed several large Western and national banks. I've uh, been a director of, auto, of finance in the auto industry, which was not the highlight of my career. <laughs> but at the heart of it all has been CX and uh, treating people right, making sure they have a great experience and making sure that it goes just beyond business, that it goes about kind of changing humanity and changing our perceptions of each other and what better way to start, you know, I, I know it's cliche, but 
if you really want to make a difference in the world, start with the way you interact at, at your businesses. And it can really just go from there because I really believe that um, the, a great indicator of how people behave in public is how they're treated at work. And there's some pretty badly treated people out there. And so we really can um, make a difference by just how we treat our, our employees and our customers. That was spawned by some very difficult things I've gone through personally and, you know, in business. And so it all just kind of came together um, and put it all down on paper and, and just put it out there. And so, but it's always been at, at, at my core. Um, I've attended the Disney Institute, the Ritz Carlton Institute, the Zappa School of Wow. So the literally the best of the best. And um, it's, that's just, that's just where my heart lies is in, is in customer experience, because it's not, again, just about business. It's about treating people uh, the way you'd want to be treated. Wow, wonderful! So you got three of the uh, the ace the aces in the pack there. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder when Patagonia will set up. You know the Patagonia uh, Institute. Um, yeah. well, wonderful. And I mean, it, you, you talk about that very breezily there, but let's let's not underestimate the difference between having a good collection of ideas in your head converting them into a, a narrative which has kind of a, a, a string of consciousness that runs through it and then getting it published so i mean there must have been points there where you thought huh what have i got to you know share with the world in terms of my customer service knowledge that they haven't heard already i mean how did you have the confidence to you know push forward with that i didn't <laughs> I just, <laughs> that's a very I just honest answer it. i just did it um i figured you know what, it is what it is and uh, put it out there. And, and if it, if somebody enjoys it, then they'll enjoy it. If not, then chalk it up to another, you know, tried and maybe failed thing in life. But I believe you have to try. Mm -hmm. It's okay if you fail, but if you never tried, then that's the real failure. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, that, that was a concern because I would read, you know, books from like really esteemed authors like like Gavin or Micah Solomon or Shep Hyken and others and I'd be like they're just they're just saying the same thing over and over again maybe just a little different what what do I have to do but I think where I tried to come out of from a different angle was a I interpret things very differently um, mm -hmm. than you know what they might be saying or I took it very differently but also how did I apply it and mm -hmm. versus how just saying it versus how I applied it and it's also coming from a layman. Um, while I respect, you know, like I, I think we can all respect, you know, great CEOs or things like that of companies. But when you hear them talk, it's kind of hard to relate to them because it's like, well, you know, you grew up kind of wealthy or you grew up kind of, you know, privileged. It's very hard to relate versus coming from someone who has been there, who yeah. has worked those front lines, who has experience these things firsthand maybe that's a difference that i can bring to the table and so that's where i kind of put it all together uh and and it really seemed to resonate yeah, well, well a different a difference it is it certainly is an addition to the to the um the, the book club as opposed to i think you do a, a, a misservice there it doesn't feel like it's just you know an, an extra chapter it feels like you've got a really different unique kind of voice in this so it's wonderful so i'll cut let's go around the go around the room then so let's go to you first of all nick um if you just give me kind of you know your your, your overall observations and uh general views on on the book pretend brian's not there <laughs> no no on the contrary yeah i wouldn't ever say anything that i wouldn't say to him directly of course um no i, I mean i think the book was really set out well i mean the amount of anecdotes and examples in it was phenomenal um and i think that that will help the audience get their heads around this as, as you say some people won't have experienced it they won't have worked on the shop floor or they've you know they've only ever been a lifelong customer so to to be able to to depict the same situation two or three different ways with real life examples really brought that out and sort of brought it to life for me. And I thought that was a really good way of, of engaging with uh, me as a, as a reader. Um, and also as a CX practitioner, it's like, oh yeah, I recognize that or oh, recognize this. So all of these things were starting to build a very strong picture at the beginning of the book. Um, and you break it into two parts. So the first bit is kind of all the rubbish, all the things we experience that we just get frustrated with and why it could be happening and why leadership can be so important in influencing those things. And um, the second half is you know, what can you do to start unpicking it? How do you start building it back up? And some simple but yet powerful 
anecdotes there to support why certain changes can be made relatively easily um, in the way it's described in the book to help organizations improve their customer service and it's yeah it was a really nicely rounded way of, of putting it together so yeah thank you for doing it that way brilliant thank you brilliant. yeah really good observation i i <laughs> i do i do feel like you're the customer's friend in this um very much so you know presenting it as uh, an a, a a, a, a comrade as opposed to kind of um, on the business side and just kind of apologizing for the customer is a really different perspective. The customers need a friend. The companies have enough help. They, they've got enough money and they have enough help that the customer sometimes needs a friend and an advocate too. So I appreciate that. <laughs> Wonderful. And thank, okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick. I appreciate the, 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 the kind words. Thank you. No, no, you're welcome. Um, oh, I'm going to come to you next. Okay, you know what, Brian, when I was reading your book, I, I felt that it was brutally simple and brutally honest. <laughs> so it's like kind of deliberately free from compl complicated frameworks or theories, uh, because sometimes in CX, it looks so beautifully polished and it looks perfect on the screen until you start implementing it in real life. And then the complications come. So you come from a completely different perspective. So starting from a very like real life things and then bringing more, them more into structure. And uh, uh, what I really loved is like your personal touch. It was like, it was a conversation between two of us. You're really telling the stories and how it happens with you being a customer and you being part of a let's say, unperfect customer experience the company was creating. And it actually made me rethink my own customer experience. So I'm also a CX professional helping companies build better uh, customer experience. But at the same time, I use different products and services every day. And you just start asking right questions. Why do you need to do so many unnecessary things that have no value? for you as a customer, why the company is forcing you to do so. Say you're registering for a flight if you're flying with an airline. So I, I just ask myself, what's the value it brings to me as a customer? And the answer is like zero. This is an internal process. <laughs> why then it's uh, sitting on my shoulders? Why the airline is not doing it themselves? Some airlines even take a cost, like they ask for a payment to do that for you. So they really can do it technically, but somehow they don't. And many other little things, you really start like broadening your perspective at looking at this interaction. And it invites you to really start from the scratch, like rethink the experience you have with other brands. And on a brand perspective, again, start from a blank piece of paper and saying, okay, if we start all over again, how the experience could be, and I would say this is one of the biggest benefits of your book, that it really invites to start from the scratch. Mm, that's a really mm. good observation. Anything to, to say to that, Brian? I mean, Olga, you, you're, you hit it spot on. Um, I, I write a lot about getting rid of the stupid rules that just make absolutely no sense that are, it, rules are fine. You know, they make sense sometimes. But you'll find more often than not, they make absolutely no sense. And they're just there for the purpose of being there. And so it not only doesn't add value, but it creates a bad perception. So you are 100% spot on. And I really appreciate what you said about, um, I, I didn't, this really isn't complicated. And let's not make it harder than it has to be. Let's just keep it, let's go back to that old KISS principle. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, let's just get back to the simplicity of it. and and treat people right. So I really appreciate your uh, your comments on that. Thank you. Brilliant. Brilliant. And Tom, can I come to you, please? What's your review of the sure, book? Yeah, I'm going to echo some of the things that have been said because the thing that appealed to me was the simplicity uh, of it and the, and the honesty. Um, I mean, you didn't pull any punches, right? And you weren't looking <laughs> to curry favour. I guess there's a line in there about human resources departments are inhumane. And uh, I guess many... Many departments, many human resources departments actually are book read and apply principles that they've read, but perhaps have never actually had to put into place in practice. And I think anybody who's managed teams know for well that if you inspire them to perform better by treating them really well, then the customer in turn um, benefits. So I think it was infused with common sense, which I absolutely 
loved through the book. As you say, it isn't rocket science. I mean, the, you, you do beg the question, why don't senior management teams understand that they have to apply uh, a focus and effort into looking after the staff first and foremost and getting the little things right, putting the customers first. And of course, now we have the mantra being adhered to with many writers writing about, you should put, the, uh, put staff first, but I think there's still a long way to go. I did wonder if you wrote from an American perspective or if it was a global perspective, because uh, you are quite damning of, uh, of service uh, overall. And I guess there is, there is a cultural thing at play and an economics thing at play. But um, the book was a really straightforward read, which I enjoyed. I love simplicity. I think um, denuding everything of complexity is a very good idea in, in this day and age. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a great book of work. And my final note that I jotted down after reading it was to say, if anybody reads this and doesn't get the point that you're trying to make and doesn't understand it and then doesn't go on to apply it, then they shouldn't be in management. <laughs> wow that's a wow i love that tom and I, obviously i am an american and that's that's what i know i but i think that while each example is a little different culturally i think overall it's it, it can be the same you know um even even in very high hospitality driven cultures say like the middle east or in polynesia or things like that we're still human beings and we, <clears throat> we get things wrong. And so again, while I can only speak from, let's say a more of American, Canadian, North American perspective, um, I think that the problems are universal. And Chris and I kind of talked about that on the podcast where, you know, we both gave examples of over there in the United Kingdom of really great and bad examples. Um, uh, somebody, I forget who, but told about, you know, the Ryanair example, you, you get what you pay for. And uh, even here in the U in the, I remember Ryanair tried to charge people, I think, to use the bathroom. And I'm like, yeah. even we haven't gone that, <laughs> we haven't even gone that far. I mean, American airlines and United sucks, but I mean, at least they let you use the bathroom. So we'll, we'll give them that one. So. Yeah. Excellent. At Excellent. least they didn't go so far as to time the amount of time you had in the bathroom. That would have been good. Oh my, too far. my God. Like. <laughs> Well, what's next do you get like are you going to be put in the pet carrier and put underneath it's like geez like come on so you, you touched on something there tom which um i always think about when i'm, I'm reading uh, a book is who is going to get the most value from this yeah. and um i did i did think to myself and apologies uh brian if this doesn't come across correctly but i think if i was going into customer service i would read your book and think it can't be like this no way it can't be like this. But obviously, if I've been there for, for a while and I've got complacent in my role and perhaps mid-manager who's kind of thinking, how do I take it to the next level? It's the perfect digest to kind of just remind yourself, oh, my God. Yeah, I recognize all these things, which may, maybe I, I thought I was doing with the right intentions, but I've lost my way. And this felt for me a real, that sort of manager who can reset the way they're going and go in the right direction. I think if you're a Zappos or you're um, in, a, in a customer service, I recently judged at the, uh, the Stevie Awards, there's some brilliant customer service entries there. I think some of those guys might, might read it and laugh a lot, <laughs> just kind of, you know, because they'd recognize a lot of the examples and just see kind of the bear traps and the banana skins that they've avoided. But though that was my sense of it. It was someone who's in customer service who actually would say, oh, man, yeah, I've got to turn left. This is not, I can't keep going the way I'm going. Well, what were others' observations in terms of the, the audience it's designed for? I'll come to, come to you first, Olga. Who, who do you think would benefit from reading it? Well, I would say probably everyone would benefit from it, everyone within the organization. The customer facing staff, the end for them, it would be probably just to prove how important they are. For middle management to understand their role of being a liaison between the customer facing staff and the management, and for the management as well, uh, for understanding like who brings the money to their table which is they kind of always know, but somehow it keeps being forgotten during all those business meetings about marketing and finance and everything. So I would say every single person would benefit. They would just take different benefits from reading this. And because of the like a simple language and simple approach, every single person within the organization can really relate themselves to the examples Brian is 
giving. So they are not really complicated measurements and formulas, you know, and uh, the like the business case. It's like a real life example you face every day when you go to, I don't know, drive to work to buy to buy bread and you see the same things you can relate to them and say aha that's how it really feels so it's really for everyone um, mm -hmm. my question was when i was reading the book because it really invites you to rethink the whole process is what would be the starting point because if you realize that so many things go wrong you come to this realization and lots of things need to be changed so where to start What's the first step you need to make to, to start changing, making things say like healthy again? Mm. And that's such a great question, Olga. Um, obviously, if you're a startup organization, it's a lot easier to kind of put things back on track than say a large established organization that's really set in its ways. And a lot of people ask me that, you know, um, and I think it's really first, a, 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 you have to really examine yourself. You have to look in the mirror and be like, something is just not right here. And sometimes it takes some hard reality and some tough truth. Um, I've mentioned a lot in the books, my two books about Gordon Ramsay. And yeah, he's very pretentious and things like that. But we have to remember he is there to make a show and he's there to make money. And so I, I do believe a lot of that is scripted, but we can learn something. And so, you know, I know over there in the UK, he had uh, Gordon uh, Ramsay's kitchen nightmares here. It was called kitchen nightmares. And then he had hotel hell and some others, but the number one thing he would always say um, with these owners of these restaurants, they're like, oh no, it's our food is great and our staff is great and everything's just wonderful. He's like, well, then where's all your customers? You know, wh why do you have these horrible social media reviews? Why, why is it 12 o'clock on a, on a busy afternoon at work and nobody's here? Why is it a Friday or Saturday night in downtown and nobody's here? It's not your customers. And it's certainly not your food. It's you. And if you are happy where you are, then keep doing what you're doing. But if you really want to save your business and you need to come to that realization, and it's, it's I, I really hate to use this analogy, but it's almost like an addiction. You have to hit rock bottom at some point. And you have to look at yourself and say, okay, enough is enough. I have to change. And I can start to be that change. And that's, that is your responsibility as a manager to go to your senior people or to whoever and say, look, this is not right. And sadly, there are some companies that are okay with that. That's when you need to look inside yourself and say, do I want to continue working here or do I want to do something different? And just like customers have so many choices now, so do employees. And there will be a company out there that will value you and will want you and will appreciate you. And so you can go somewhere else and really start to make those changes. But it all begins with how we look at ourselves. And are we, are we, if we're truly tired and frustrated of the way things are, then it's up to us to be that change. So it's really pointing the finger here. <laughs> it is. It's just like, it's just like Gordon Ramsay says, he's like, it's, it's, it's not your customer's fault and it's not the food it's you. And so you have two choices here, either own up or keep losing money and be out of business and see how that works out for you. So just extending that analogy a, a, a small bit, Brian, because you, you look at those programs and you kind of wonder what life was like before Gordon Ramsay turned up. Were, were, were they always broken to start with or has something changed so what's your observation in terms of customer service does, does the organization not have the kind of the, the heart the purpose correctly set up or have things changed silly things like you know technology changes or they've not invested in the training their products are out of date what what's the catalyst i mean i i get the rock bottom thing but in your your experience you work with a lot of organizations what are the typical catalysts that, that turn okay into not very good or, or were they always not very good 
I mean, no, the, the, there's definitely been, I mean, I think cultural changes. Again, I can only speak from an American perspective. So maybe it was different. You know, maybe, maybe in the United Kingdom or in Russia, it was different in the 50s than it was here in America. I don't know. But I can only speak from that perspective. Um, I think there's always been broken processes. I mean, it, it goes, as, as you read in the very first you know, pages of the book, I talked about the very first, you know, bad customer, one of the first customer service interactions 3,000 years ago in, in, a ancient, in the ancient world. So that was probably the first, you know, recorded social media post ever was <laughs> in ancient Babylon. So that was kind of neat. Um, so there's always been broken processes, but people have been broken from the days of Adam and Eve, you know, um, we, we're human beings. We, we are, we make mistakes. Um, but on a collective effort, I think it's gotten worse over time. Um, and yeah, Gordon Ramsay just exposed uh, because he had a platform because he has a name, he exposed it, but it's always been there. Um, shows like undercover boss helped exposed it. Ramsey exposed it. Br uh, Richard Branson has exposed it. A lot of people have just really brought it out as technology has, you know, really been advented and really come forward, but it's always been there. Um, I remember as a kid, seven or eight years old in the, in the late eighties, observing bad processes and bad interactions of service. So it's always been there as long as human beings have been around and will be around uh, until we're all replaced by robots. One day we're going to have these bad experiences. Um, the goal is to make them not the majority, but the minority. Right. And so we want to make sure that we develop these processes so that the we don't have to write books like ours anymore right <laughs> is that we have so many great experiences that 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 when you do get a bad experience you kind of chuck up and be like oh, okay that was probably just a, a rarity whereas now when you get great service you're like that was really cool because yeah. i'm not expecting that yeah, we want to we want to reverse that Fair enough. Great. Thank you for that. Um, sorry for intervening there. Uh, Tom, can I come to you for your kind of uh, your question, please, for the for, for Brian? Oh, crumbs. Well, I, I did come at it from uh, I, at the perspective of whether it was American or whether, whether it was global. Um, you, so I'll, I'll backtrack a little bit. You, you, you talk very much about the um, human resources function not being up to the, the task in hand and perhaps being inhabited by the, the wrong people was the kind of inference in there. How would you set about impacting the human resources function? Because when you think in terms of who has to change, they are key influencers within the organization. Um, how would you address that? Wow, Tom, that's such a big question and, and it's an important one. Um, you're so right. There is a, I, in my humble opinion, and I know a lot of human resources people will probably disagree with me, but there is very little humanity left in human resources. Um, they shouldn't even have the title human resources because they are forgetting that they're dealing with human beings and that is their number one priority. There is a real, at least here in the United States, there has started to be a real, not a, not a, not a, Vo like not a big movement, but a very vocal movement about disrupting human resources and really changing it and putting the humanity back and acknowledging that there is a very broken, uh, a broken system, not just in the way we hire people, but in the way we treat people, human resources, people now their, their sole responsibility, it seems like is to explain your benefits package, um, handle an internal complaint and onboard you and you know screen a, a computer generated application well where's the humanity in that i mean you could hire a robot to do that and robots are kind of what you get and so we do need to begin it all begins with the human resources a very good friend of mine who's a director of human resources for one of the largest cities in the state of utah actually i mean i i I, I don't want to brag, but he said I inspired him to conduct a, a test. And so he had for a particular position, he had 75 applicants for a certain position. He said, I'm going to respond to every single one of them personally. I'm going to give them feedback. I'm going to 
go over every resume and, and check it out and give them some feedback. And he did a little poll and a, and a study. And he found that the vast majority of people said, you are the first person to ever take time to just give us feedback and how much we appreciate it. Whether the answer was what we wanted or not, you at least gave us feedback. You explained why we didn't get the job, but you provided resources and, and uh, future steps on how to improve. That means a lot to us. And it really, is it time consuming? Absolutely. But is it the right thing to do? Yes, because we have a broken system. Because again, these are not just computers or robots on the other end. These are real people. And especially as we're emerging out of COVID-19 and during COVID-19, people here in America are desperate. They're, they're at their, I mean, our mental health rates, our suicide rates are, are insanely ungodly horrible right now because people are out of work. They're out of money. They, have, they don't know what to do. And so the least you can do as a human resource, the least you can do is take 30 seconds out of your day and say, here's why. It doesn't take that long. Mm -hmm. And so you're right, Tom, it has to begin with human resources. And quite frankly, I might write another book called Why Human Resources Sucks and How We Can Make It Great Again, <laughs> because it really does. It's, it is, I think, a broken system and and it, it, it does begin there. And if, if we want to change business, we've got to start changing with human, with human resources. Th th thank you for that question, Tom. And, and Brian, it reminds me of a conversation I had years ago with a sales director and a human resource director. And the sales director said to the human resource director, what would you think if I got lots of sales in and I decided, yeah, I won't process them all. I'll choose the ones I want to process and the rest I just drop on the floor. She said, well, you'd probably lose your job. I said, well, why do you do it that way? Well, what do you mean? So well, you have gold. Every time you ask for a job to be advertised, you get these incredible individuals who put their hands up and say, I'm interested. I don't know how much a sale is worth today, tomorrow, in the future, but I make sure I nurture every single one of them. Why don't we do that with people? And, and at the time, I must confess, it kind of just went through me. But hearing you talk there, it's kind of put the hairs on the back of my head because I understand exactly what he meant now. And you're right, it's the least you can actually do. Well, you might have noticed another box has popped open on our screen. We've been joined by Gavin Scott. Hi, Gavin. Hello, how are you doing, Brian? Forgive me. In my head, I had this down at four o'clock. And so I've just collected my girls from school and I came back and noticed the email to say, you know, Gav, where are you? So I'm so sorry that um, I, got, I messed up with my timings there. So hands up. Uh, that was uh, that was my mistake. So, uh, Gavin, believe it or not, you're not the last. So you're all right. You're OK. There we I'll, go. I'll forgive then, you this one time, Gavin, but this that, is the one, one time. And I, and I think, Gavin, if you'd have told us, I've decided to come to the book club and the girls are waiting outside the school, then uh, then we wouldn't have forgiven you. So I think you right. made the right choice. Yep. <laughs> well, look, look, welcome. And Jonathan Daniels has turned up as well. So it's great to see uh, Jonathan arrive from, from, from Belgium as well. So look, what we've done is we've had an introduction. We're just working our way through our questions for Brian. So um, uh, we've got Nick to go and then I'll, I'll come down to you, um, Gavin, and uh, um, get you before you ask your question. Just give a little introduction to yourself, um, a bit of reflection on, on how you found the book and then pose your question to Brian, if that works for you. And the same, same for you, Jonathan. I'll get you to do that as well. OK, Nick, so over yeah. to you for your question, please, sir. Looking forward to this one. <laughs> no pressure there. Um, but in the book, Brian, you mentioned that, that I mean, there's lots of scenarios where poor leadership has uh, been reversed almost with new blood coming in, new people coming in and, and always fixing the problem. And it, it is sad that it's quite a common occurrence in traditionally structured companies because it's mm -hmm. you end up with silos, the targets drive certain behaviours. But for those managers and leaders who've arrived at a situation unintentionally they've created a level of toxicity without meaning to what what would you advise them because it's it seems easy just to replace somebody bring in a fresh thinking and everything changes overnight but for those who've arrived at this situation through inexperience or through other means but have the awareness to perhaps realize that that's of their doing how how would you recommend they they adapt and, and try to fix the situation, which could be more challenging because, of mm -hmm. course, yeah, they've been the cause potentially of the situation. 
That's a great question, Nick. Thank you. So let me first start off by saying I do not in any way advocate just if somebody's created that culture or is doing badly, I don't just believe in walking and saying, well, you know, thanks, but you're fired. I do believe in giving them opportunities to change. That's and as many opportunities as are available and are and are feasible. I don't believe in just blind firing and just sweeping, you know, it under the rug and hiring because that that doesn't that doesn't do anything. Um, but what I also believe is that if you if you want to be a customer centric organization and you want to deliver those great experiences, and everybody has to be on board with that. Um, uh, Isidore Sharp of the Four Seasons Hotel he wrote about. Um, how he wanted to do that. And he said that we wanted to become a guest centric organization. And there were many tenured, long term senior executives who had been with the company for 25, 30 years, who simply were not on board with our new vision. And I had to ask for them to go because it's the right thing to do. And it's because that's now the vision we want to take the company. Um, so we absolutely need to give them a chance. So, how do we do that? Well, again, it begins. If you're completely unaware that what you're doing is wrong, then then you need to be humble enough to listen to your team. And that's part of being a great leader is you should always have been listening in the first place. We need to listen to our team and we need to listen to what they're saying. We need to listen to what our customers are saying. We need to listen and, again, ask ourselves, am I doing these things? It is taking a hard examination. Of course, nobody likes to admit they're wrong. We all think we're doing the right thing. But again, there comes a point where you, like Gordon Ramsay, going back to him, says, they're not, they're not the problem. There's something different. There's obviously a disconnect here. And so it takes a lot of internal courage and, and self-reflection to acknowledge those things. Um, sometimes it takes upper management coming down and saying, hey, th- you need to change. <laughs> but the change does need to occur. And so how do we do that? Well, we begin by kind of going back to basics and doing the job our team is doing, you know, seeing things from their perspective and getting to know them and asking our team, like, walk me through your day. What is it like? And let's record the good and let's record the bad and let's map this out. Let's, let's, let's come up with a, with a journey, not just a customer journey, but an employee journey and find out where's, where is it broken? Where are we hitting some potholes? Where are we getting into rush hour traffic? And how do we improve that, that journey? And so there's so many things, I mean, there's way a lot more things we could discuss on that, Nick, but in, in essence, it again, comes back to self-reflection. And, and if you are a leader of an organization, sometimes you do have to make those difficult decisions. In a, you know, I'm not, I'm not particularly religious anymore, but where I live in the state of Utah, this is a very Mormon state. The Mormon church is very strong here. And in the Book of Mormon, I think there's a great scripture that actually can relate to business. And it says, it is better that one man perish than the entire nation dwindle. And what that means is sometimes you have to make those sacrifices for the good of the entirety. You know, you could maybe the old saying, one bad apple spoils the bunch, I think is the same concept. We have to look out for the organization and look out for the customers and look out for the team. And sometimes if a person is not willing to make those changes after they've been given a chance to do so, sometimes it's time to cut down the bad branch and, and start over and, and, and change. Um, so that would be, I guess, the, the simple answer to your question. Right, can I interject with a question? What if, the prob- what if the problem is the CEO? Because great companies tend to be great yeah. companies because of the leadership from the CEO, like Disney or uh, uh, over here, Tesco, in the great days of Terry mm-hmm. Leahy. What if the problem stems or sits with the CEO? How does one address yeah. that? Then, then it becomes then it becomes the I think the issue or not the issue but the priority of the employee to make the statement by um, by walking out because again you can only what what is that saying you can only be a dictator so long as the army is behind you you know you can only be you can only have a company if there's employees so if everybody walks out 
and you know, or your sales begin to suffer and that CEO can't afford to be CEO anymore, that's going to make a really uh, a, 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 a profound statement. So it, yeah, it, there's many companies that are just churn and burn organizations. That's all they do is they'll bring in some people, they'll do a job, they'll leave, then they'll bring in some more. If that if that's what floats your boat, then I guess that's fine uh, for you, but it's not going to stay that way forever. And your sales and your customers are going to tell you so. So that's a great question. But I think in that particular situation, the employees need to be the ones to vote with their feet and 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 go somewhere else. So almost the uh, get your stuff and get out could apply to the, uh, the employee if it's too much. I know Jeannie Walters talks about enlightened leaders and, um, you know, it kind of is a bit of a binary thing that if their leader isn't enlightened, then it's going to be a real challenge to turn the turn the organisation around. So uh, excellent. Mm-hmm. Thanks for that, Thomas. Really, really good question. Appreciate that. So, Gavin, can I, can I come to you then if you want to just introduce yourself and uh, give Brian the, your, your reflection on his book and then please pose your question. Sure. Thank you, Chris. Um, so, yes, my name is Gavin Scott, based in the, in the UK, in, in South Yorkshire. And um, my whole background has been in customer service roles. I left university and joined a company called O2 and helped to move them from fourth to first in the marketplace when it comes to customer satisfaction. And I realized that uh, some of the approaches that I were taking were making lots of money for a large business. And so I decided to go solo. And in 2009, I set up my own training company, and now I focus on helping people to have great conversations with their customers, even if they've got no previous customer service knowledge or skills. And so I wrote a book called Finding Gold Dust, uh, which got to number one on Amazon before Christmas. I had a Christmas number one, which is brilliant. <laughs> and um, I've had uh, the pleasure of speaking to, to Brian already. Yeah. There, there you go. Look at that. Take a photo. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, what I got from the book and uh, was Brian's passion uh, for the customer experience um, was, was, was certainly felt within the first few pages. And, you know, the stories that he shared, uh, both good and bad, um, really brought some of the practical tools to life. Um, and certainly a lot of them resonated with me because... Um, you know, he talks about the Ritz-Carlton and I, I experienced uh, the Ritz-Carlton on my honeymoon. And, you know, I told Brian that when, when we arrived in, in Egypt, Sharm El Sheikh back in 2005, we, we got out of the taxi and uh, before we even got to the hotel front door. And, and, and as we opened the taxi door, there was a band at the front foyer and they started to play Here Comes the Bride. And we were thinking, how do they know this? How do they know this? Um, I mean, my wife looked at me and she said, well done, love. This is a great choice of hotel. <laughs> and, I, and I knew nothing about it. But, but, but Brian talked, to, you know, he talks about the, the approach that they take and really focusing on their, on their values and, and bringing them to life every day. And, and um, yeah, so, you know, the, the, the whole section around language really resonated. So I loved it. Um, and it was a great read. And, you know, it was definitely, you know, some real passion. So my question was, and let me just quickly have a look at the question I sent across then. So I said, um, how did you go about collating all of those stories that you shared in your book? Uh, that was my first question, Brian. Good one. Yeah. So I'll be in the interest of full disclosure. In both books, I talk about, I say, a friend of mine or a colleague of mine. In reality, that's not true. Everything in these books happened to me. I just didn't want to come off as, oh, this is the Brian Horn show and he's so into himself. So my publisher said, tweak it a little bit, you know, Um, there's maybe like, there's maybe like three examples where those really did happen to other people. But in reality, most of it I experienced firsthand or have wit- it either happened to me or I've witnessed it or it happened, you know, in my career and my as a manager and things like that. Um, so it's all from from right here. But reading other books like like Gavin's or Micah Solomon's or, you know, I would also come up, I would read um, this is a this was my book from Disney Institute called Be Our Guest. And I would read something that they would talk about and it would just trigger a memory and be like, oh, I remember when. And so I would, you know, 
or or my friend you know explains something like that and so i just kind of put it all together and then um yeah just it, it's all real world it's all just real stuff that's happened or i observed or i've heard about uh, i do obviously quote other authors and other things in there but 99 percent of it it all i've i've experienced it or, or knew somebody who did and the, the thing is that worked for me, Brian, I mean, I was sat in bed with my wife one evening and I think it was the story about um, there was a situation where it was snowing and um, one of the one of the people wanted to leave early and uh, and it was told they can't. But then the boss left early himself. Yep. That was me. And, and, and I was sitting there saying to my wife, just imagine what you'd feel like, love. You know, and I was saying when I used to work at O2 and it used to start snowing, we used to say to the guys, Right, guys, you know what? For those of you who live miles away in the hills, get gone, right? Get gone now. Um, yeah. And for those of you who can walk home, you know, do me a favor. Can you just help out a little bit and stay? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, and, and, and so, so yeah, so my wife was sat there while she was trying to go to sleep. And I was going, saying to her, just imagine what this would feel like, love, you know, on the, you know, if you were an employee of this organization, that's just crazy. Um, yeah. So it got that emotional reaction. So I think the stories worked really well. And, uh, you know, I certainly enjoyed them. Thanks, Kevin. So, so I'm going to ask on the back of that then, because um, this kind of reveals something around death words. I mean, yes. you know, it's, it's, that, that's a really well structured piece. And I think it kind of it feels like some of those like, oh, thank goodness I've never been to in that situation. I mean, are, are, are those things that, you know, are, are, are built around your own personal experience as well then? So you, you've come into contact and seen that from colleagues or been a, a customer and come across some of those. And, you know, can, can I can I ask you, if it's not dramatic, I mean, how does that make you feel? Do, do you think, because someone said to me the other day that a really bad customer service call never leaves you. And, mm -hmm. I, and, I, and I kind of got what they meant that actually, you know, you carry it around for a long time. You don't, they, people don't realize you carry it for a long time. With things like death words, do you think they're things you do take with you for a long time? Absolutely. I mean, there, there's, there's just something about those words or things that you say that do stick with people. And, you know, we, we used to have that old saying here in, in the United States, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names or words can never hurt me. Well, I think in the business sense, there couldn't be anything further from the truth. Um, your words do matter in business and in life. And so those can stay with people for a very long time. And so, yeah, I, I remember things from when I was a kid from bad service interactions or just bad people. I still remember those things. I think it's just our human nature to, for whatever reason, we tend to hold on to the bad and forget the good. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And whatever, I, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a biologist, so I don't know the whole science behind that. But yeah, there, there really is something there that, that, that uh, keeps us remembering those things. And that can be a really good thing. That can be a catalyst for change and saying like, okay, I never want to experience this again. So here's how I'm going to do it different. And that's, that's what motivated me to write the first book was like, if I hadn't experienced it, if I put it down on paper, I'd be like, this is total BS. Like no one's going <laughs> to believe this, but I'm like, it really did happen. And it's so shocking that it did happen that I'm like, this is how I would do it differently. And this is what I would never do in the first place. So I, I appreciate you mentioning that because yeah, Gavin, like you said, if I had not experienced it, I would, I would have put it down and you probably would have could tell I was lying because like this, this can't happen, but it does. Mm. And it happens more often than I think we'd like to admit, um, but it does happen. And, and so we need to say like, okay, this is how I would do it differently. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Well, look, we're going to give this a go. I see Jonathan is there in, um, in graphic, um, but I'm not sure he's 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 there otherwise. Let, let's see, Jonathan, are you with yeah. us? Yeah. Hey, hello. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. All right. Yeah, Welcome. Yeah. Right. So, Jonathan, if you if you wouldn't mind, we've got your your question to go. So, if you wouldn't mind them introducing your yourself uh, to the other guests and to um, Brian, um, give a quick synopsis of what you've thought of his book, and then please pose your question. Okay. Good. Hi, guys, um, and thank you, Brian, as well. Uh, I'm Jonathan Daniels. I'm actually originally from the UK, but I've been out in Belgium for about five years now. Um, I run CX Brussels, a not-for-profit where 
we basically run events, trainings, workshops in Belgium. We also have a CX centric, a, a consulting com company and here um, in Belgium and we work across the world. Um, so yeah, I found the book very, the, the thing that I liked, it was very authentically written. But I had, uh, you know, I did think, I'm thinking he's saying, okay, one of my fr friends or colleagues, you know, when he's coming up with the examples and I, the way he was describing it, it did seem as if it could have, it couldn't have been someone else just because of the detail. Uh, and the other thing I liked about it, the, the tone was good. Um, and even the backstory was very inspiring as well. Like the journey that, that Brian actually had. And the other thing, just to focus on, on uh, employee experience as a whole, like just that topic is so crucial and it's never been more crucial, uh, like, you know, especially with the COVID and stuff. So just to read that and see some good examples, I found, I found the whole thing very good overall. I really enjoyed it. Um, the, the question I, I had uh, firstly was around the role, um, I don't know if I can say that, of, of customer service resource because I'm seeing that um, basically the, the customer problems are getting more and more complex. Um, so I was just wondering from Brian, how did he see things? Do you think it's always going to be the case that you can easily give customer a customer service agent um, like a script, et cetera, just to read off? Or do you think that uh, we're going to need to start paying them more and they're going to be basically having to basically basically problem solvers in that sense and the problems are getting harder so the actual role uh, will sort of change or transition in the next five to ten years i just wanted to know what uh brian's thoughts were uh, i don't know if i'm explaining that question properly you get that brian i think i did did you get it yeah i think i did jonathan and thank you for that um so scripting has never ever worked um I think it I think it works in the sense of you should I think have a script of how you begin your conversation and end your conversation. Um, because people always remember the beginning and the end of something. But in between there, that's where genuine authenticity needs to come through and empowerment needs to come through by employees. And so that's the first key is we need to take those scripts and we need to rip them up and throw them out the window because it's never ever worked. And customers can tell when you're reading from a script, when they, when you're just kind of going through and checking boxes or, you know, it's, it's by your inflection, by your tone, by lots of things that can tell you're just kind of faking it. Now, in response to Jonathan's question of, do we need to pay more? Um, I mean, yeah, we need, as, as companies are making record profits, I think that we need to pay our employees more because again, you get what you pay for. Um, if you want great service, then you need to treat employees great. And that starts, part of that component is a, is a great salary, a competitive salary. So now I'm not an advocate in any way of like here in America, it's the big, the big topic right now is, you know, raising the minimum wage to $15. I am in no way in favor of that. I believe you are worth what you, what you put into it. So I'm not saying that, but uh, yeah, Paying people more, I don't think is even, we can't just throw money at something and expect it to get fixed. But as we empower our employees, as we give them more discretion and more freedom, it's actually been found by science that they are the best producers and the best employees at a company. Zappos, again, is a great example. They're, they have a list of five, five things that their employees cannot do. And as long as it's not one of those five, you can do it. Just do it. JetBlue has something very similar. As long as it falls within our five core values, do it. Just take care of it. Ritz-Carlton is the same way. Nordstrom is the same way. Just take care of the guest. And that leads to great experiences. And I would contend, Jonathan, again, this is just my belief, that the problems of customers are not as complex as we want them to be, we just choose to make them that way. Because they're really not, I don't think, that difficult. And even if they are difficult, 
it doesn't take rocket science to figure out how to do it. Because if we are empowered to step into the shoes of our customer, that problem has probably happened to us. So how did we deal with it? And if a company allows you to be empowered to do that, to, to think that way, then it doesn't become a problem. Anymore. It's a very simple answer because it's like, oh, well, here's what I did and I'm going to do it now. So uh, there, there's a lot of validity to your question, Jonathan, and I appreciate it. I do, again, I don't think throwing money at it is the answer. Um, definitely a, 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 a good wage as you progress and as you've proven yourself, I think is important. But it, it, it really begins with employee empowerment and companies trusting people to do the job. And I think COVID-19, if there is a good thing that came out of COVID-19, it's that companies had to make those, those, they had to give that empowerment to let people work from home, to let people be adults and be human beings. And guess what? The vast majority stepped up and rose, rose above and beyond. And so they proved that they were adults after all. They didn't need to have their hands held like little children. They did it. And how that's really changed employee culture. So I think that though, all those together, that's, that's kind of where I see it going. Brilliant. I love that, Brian. Yeah, it was great. And, and I know that the uh, Edelman Trust Barometer showed that over 70% of consumers would think seriously twice about going back to an organization that didn't respect its employees during COVID. So, you know, it's, it started to permit, there was fewer transactions. So what do you notice? You notice the way the organizations look after the people mm-hmm. it employs and the communities it serves. Well, what a, what a perfect note to, to, to wrap up on. So, um, look, thank you to all the guests for coming along. Thank you for reviewing the book. I'm glad you got, it sounds like you got a lot out of it. And I think, uh, Brian, you've affected all of us in a positive way and your work will live on in, in our work going forward. So thank you very much for taking the time to bring it together for a second time. We look forward to the third and the fourth. Please do pursue that human resources book. I think it'll be a fascinating read. Um, Gavin, I think we're going to see you at some point this year on on our uh, uh, book review club, I I hope. That's the case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think I'm booked in in the the next few months. So look forward to that. Brilliant, brilliant. And um, thank, th- thank, thank you to the guest reviewers. Thank you all very much for coming along. Yeah, Brian, keep I, up the good work. I just want to say, Chris, if I could, again, to have such esteemed colleagues review this, it, it just makes my day. And it just, it, it humbles me and it, um, it lets me know that, that, I'm in, that I can compete with all of you. And, and I know that together, wherever you are in the world, we can start making a positive difference. And, and what I think is so amazing is that, yeah, we're in different parts of the world. We're in, we're in the United States, we're in Russia, we're in Brussels, we're in the United Kingdom, but we, see, we all see the same thing. We see the same issues. And that just proves that we are all human mm. and we are all taking this journey together. And so I thank all of you for your work and, for just doing what you do and together i know that we can really make a great difference and um and i i guess just end with the way i end my podcast and that is i hope you will let everything you do in life i hope love will guide you every step of the way and so but thank you this has been a a very humbling and and an honoring experience so thank you let's do this (laughs) i'm pumped up now brian let's make it happen (laughs) i think this has been the most human-centric discussion we've had of all the book reviews and i think that just reflects that you're an awesome human being brian so thank thank you you all once again and uh good luck with your cx endeavors and uh no doubt we'll talk to all of you again sometime in the near future but from the cx book club hosted by lantropy goodbye